And now back to the interviews. David, David and Amber, when I first went to Liverpool, you know, I loved the people in the city. I love everyone had a story. Everyone was amazing. It was personality and grit, but not everyone loved the Beatles. There was a lot of animosity. The, the, the city felt that the Beatles abandoned them. And, you know, what did, what did they do for us? We did everything for them. There wouldn't have been Beatles without Liverpool. But to me, there wouldn't have been Liverpool without the Beatles. Absolutely. That's, that's completely right. And that was my frustration, uh, was that I was, I was either watching things on television or I, I was reading Beatles books and they were writing about Liverpool. And, you know, this was the place the Beatles came. And they were describing it as, you know, they were dragged out of the slums. I think, no, that's not right. And I found people were writing about my city and getting it so, so wrong in thought. Where's the Liverpool voice in all these stories? Um, so in, I went out to look for a book on the Beatles and Liverpool and I couldn't find one. Um, so it took me nine years, but I wrote <laughs> and it, it changed my life completely. What, what, what was the basis of the story of your book? Uh, well, if, following from what Charles was saying there, uh, the phrase for the front I had was to understand the Beatles, you've got to understand Liverpool. Cause that is what was missing was the Liverpool voice. Um, and, you know, Charles is completely right. You know, the Beatles left Liverpool in 1963. You know, we all think, you know, they had this amazing career around the world. They split up in 1970, but they had left the city in 63. And because it was such a depressed place to be, the Beatles was, was old news. Um, but there was still, without Liverpool, you would not have had the Beatles. They could not have come from any other city on this planet. It's such a unique combination. You know, we're a huge international port. We used to be like one of the largest commercial ports in the world. So we've got this cosmopolitan mixture of people. Um, we've got this massive influx of, of the Irish who came during the, the Great Famine of the 1840s. And amongst those came McCartney's and Lennon's and helped to shape the city. But, you know, we've got the, um, the oldest Chinese community in Europe was established here. Um, one of the oldest Jewish populations, the oldest Afro-Caribbean populations. We've got such a mixture of or the Scandinavian and all these different mixes coming in. Um, but on top of that, we also had a big American influence. And that was uh, the ships that were sailing between Liverpool and New York, Liverpool and Boston. That started in the 1840s. Well, by the time you get to the, the mid 20th century, the Liverpool sailors on these ships were bringing back records and they were bringing back comics and candy and suits and cameras. And all this was, uh, was coming back into Liverpool. But most importantly, they were bringing records and they were bringing these American records. And a lot of them at the beginning, it, it was country music and it was jazz. But then those early R&B, and the rock and roll but then at the same time just outside liverpool we had the um, american air base which the uh, us took over in 1942 became the biggest air base in the second world war and so all the troops who were coming to uk to fight with, with the allies in the second world war about a million and a half came through liverpool all the parts for the tanks for the planes all came into here we're going right through into the 60s the American servicemen on that base were coming into Liverpool in their downtime and they were bringing their records, their music, their culture. So you've got all of these mixtures all in this one place. It could not have happened anywhere else at all. Um, and that's, that was the story I wanted to get across. It was Liverpool that did this. With all that influence of the different cultures, um, tell us how you see that influencing the Beatles music. Well, I think uh, definitely got the, the Irish influence. Um, and the Irish also led to country music. Uh, it's a book I've just published called the, the Country of Liverpool, Nashville of the North. Because in the 60s, Liverpool had the biggest country and western scene in Europe, which again was down to these American influences. And you can see all those country influences on the Beatles' music. I've gone through, I've made a playlist of about 25 songs the Beatles recorded, which have all got country roots. So country music my, was my, big. My favorite is uh, Ringo's um, "Act Naturally." 
the yeah, cover absolutely. that cover <laughs> that's yeah. one of my favorite ones what are some I'm of the not, other country songs it's definitely a country song but there's also rockabilly and r and B. I i mean there's a big r and B influence and that's all from the american oh, huge. soul artists yeah yeah those, those what you think combined for oh completely concept. yeah and you think of you know of the other artists that inspired him you know, elvis of course who had his roots in country buddy holly Everly Brothers, Roy Orbison, Carl Perkins, all got the roots in, in country music. And what they were doing was they were taking all these different styles and then put them together and coming up with a new sound. And that, that was the genius of it. And this is, this is the funny bit, if you think, but it's got the roots in country. The actual real roots of country are in the British folk music, which we exported to America, to the Appalachians. That then becomes country and rock and roll, which then comes over to here. We take all of that, change it, repackage it, put it into a new thing, and then we sell it back to you. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works best. Well, what do you think was the Beatles' most influential piece of music or album? Ooh, well, that they wrote or that they listened to. Your, your answer. That's tough. Okay, well, it, it's tough. I the biggest influence on them, and I'd say for all the Mersey Beat musicians, was Buddy Holly. The the Chirping Crickets album, which to me is still one of the greatest albums of all time. Um, and Buddy Holly and the Crickets played in Liverpool on the twentieth of March, nineteen fifty eight. Um, and I found out recently by talking to one of John's John Lennon's childhood friends, John did go to that gig. And it I mean. It's one of those things that, you know, I have my other pair of glasses, which are very Buddy Holly-ish. And seeing Buddy Holly is what convinced John to wear his glasses. Didn't it also you know, have an influence on the name of the group? Absolutely. So when they were trying to decide on what name to call themselves, it was Stuart Sutcliffe, the first bass player. He said, well, if Buddy Holly's got crickets, why can't we be Beatles? <laughs> so it started as an insect thing. And it's amazing, until they became famous, whenever they said... Our name's the Beatles. People went, what kind of stupid name's that? People thought it was daft. But of course, all the bands then were a lead singer and the, you know, Jerry and the Pacemakers. You know, it was always something like that. John never wanted that. It, it was suggested many times. It should be John and the, so why not John and the Beatles? No, just the Beatles. So I, I would say Buddy Holly was the, um, the biggest musical influence for John he wanted to be Elvis. You know, when he first got up on stage with his guitar, with his big quiff, he wanted to be Elvis. He said, you know, before Elvis, there was nothing. So he was this massive, massive figure in their lives. Um, George loved Carl Perkins with, with the rockabilly stuff. Ringo was the big country guy. He loved his country music. He really did. Paul's influences are varied, particularly through his dad. His dad, Jim, was a very good jazz musician and had his own uh, jazz band. So the first instrument Paul ever got was a trumpet. And he didn't like it. Which, to be fair, if you're trying to impress the girls, you might be sticking <laughs> a trumpet in your gob. Doesn't look cool, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, but it creates so he, strong lips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he, he swapped that for a guitar. Um, so they all had these varied musical backgrounds. Um, but of course, nothing happens until a guy called Lonnie Donegan uh, released a record called Rock Island Line and, and started a craze gum. called Skiffle. What about put your gum on the bed or something? What was that? Oh, just your tune gum, gum. flavor on the bedpost <laughs> overnight. I love it. I'll get me banjo out and play it for you. Um, <laughs> But Rock Island Line changed everything because in Britain, I think it was about 5,000 guitars were sold across the country in 1955. In 1956 and into 57, 250,000. Because Lonnie Donegan was saying, look at this, it's basic. It's like got its roots in American bluegrass, really. It's fast stuff, three chords. Half the instruments were homemade. Now you've got the washboard that your mum would use for washing sewing thimbles to rub up and down, a tea chest bass, which is just a, a wooden packing case, a broom handle and string. No, you play the spoons, 
a Komen, you could do anything, and probably and a guitar. It was daft, but thousands of these groups sprung up overnight because you didn't need talent. And a lot of them had <laughs> no talent at the very beginning. I mean, I mean, John Lennon couldn't even play his guitar properly until Paul McCartney came along. He, he was playing his guitar like a banjo, but it was fun. Lonnie Donegan changed absolutely everything. That was just part two. We've got a couple more parts of the interview yet to come. 